Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the internet's leading Charles Band-related podcast that isn't hosted by Mr. Band himself. I am one of your hosts, Jared Hornbeck, coming to you from a painting within a painting in Brooklyn, New York. But uh, I am not alone. No, somebody is restoring this painting of um, a painting within a painting of me. Who's here with me? Well, it's me, Sexy Beast Steve Gunley. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This is the podcast that's all about creepy circuses, beast sex, and ghost nannies. That is to say, it's a podcast about Meridian, a.k.a. Meridian Kiss of the Beast, a.k.a. The Ravaging, a.k.a. Phantoms. Lots of different titles for this one. This is Charles Band's erotically charged gothic love story, and while this one is still very steeped in the low-budget prurient thrills that we've come to appreciate and expect from Charles Band, Meridian kind of stands out as one of Full Moon's more serious-minded and, dare I say, classy movies? I don't know. It borders on classy, but uh, we'll either way, we'll, we'll get into that. But we do have somebody here joining us to uh, discuss this movie. Who's with us today? Uh, very happy to have with us today uh, someone who really needs no introduction but sort of insisted to be introduced as a self-proclaimed cultural raccoon and all-around dirtbag which is my favorite <laughs> copy of introduction we've gotten so far uh that would be charles williamson here to talk about meridian with us charles thanks for joining us today thank you for having me i uh i was assuming I'm assuming that a few hearts just palpitated very quickly whenever you said Charles, uh, <laughs> and they was immediately crushed whenever you said my last name. So, hi, all. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, thank you. We're really glad to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Char why did you want to talk specifically about this movie, Charles? Oh, boy. So, I have, like, a... <sighs> I have a long storied history with Full Moon Entertainment, and specifically this movie, to a certain extent... Uh, it's, I, I don't think anyone would describe Meridian as their favorite full moon movie, but it's Not certainly in the one, uh, well, no, no, uh, <laughs> there might be some like dark corners of the internet where folks are talking about it differently, but, uh, I, this is definitely a movie that I probably watched at a very impressionable age mm. that left like a real mark on me um, for better or worse. It kind of rewrote my DNA in a way that something like uh, Doll Man versus Demonic Toys probably didn't. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I can. I so can are, are that. you skirting around saying that you are a person of a certain age similar to two podcast hosts who spent a lot of time uh, looking around for uh uh, how should I say this scandalous content mm -hmm. to to view that maybe wasn't deemed appropriate for people of our age? I'm just just a shot in the dark here. Oh yeah, no, I, I wasn't like just a a little goblin watching late night HBO <laughs> and and pressing the record button at all the uh, opportune moments, creating like a weird pervert mixtape not at all. Who who would no. admit that publicly? Not oh. at all. Like I, I especially no, yeah. yeah. We, I, I'll, I'll give the same disclaimer we gave during the Test Tube Teens episode. We are going to be talking about some uh, 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 sexually charged content with this movie, but we're promised this is not going to be a, a tour of our own respective masturbatory histories, so you don't need to worry about that. The one thing I well, will say, one, though... One caveat, though, is that Charles did not promise that. That's true. So we, yes, <laughs> yes. So still. we don't know what's coming. Uh, the one thing I will say, though, is that it's probably a good thing that I did not know this movie existed uh, until just recently, uh, because if I had discovered this when I was an impressionable teenage boy and it's a movie full of uh, dusky, freckle-faced brunettes that I was uh, uh, crushing on immensely around that age, I would not have left the house. Yeah, I would have been I would have been MIA for years. I don't know what either of you are talking about. I just like this movie because it's because of the art restoration component. Oh, that's, of course. That's what I'm in. That's what I'm in it for. Same wow. same reason you like Ghostbusters too. Understandable. Understandable. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about this movie. This is called Meridian Kiss of the Beast, but the version I watched on Full Moon streaming channel was just called The Ravaging. So I think that might be the. I'm not sure which title is preferred. I think in Charles Band's book, he only refers to this as Meridian. This was released April 13th, 1990. It's directed by Charles Band, written by Dennis Paoli, and it stars Sherilyn Fenn, Malcolm Jameson, Hilary Mason, Charlie Spradling, Alex Daniels, and Phil Fondacaro. Now, this movie 
was actually one of the last movies the band made in Italy. He talks about a lot in his book, but he does have a rich history with Italy. His father, Albert Band, was a producer of low-budget Hercules movies back in the 50s and 60s, and so they spent a lot of time in Rome. He actually spent most of his childhood in Rome, and he even appeared in a couple of those old Hercules movies as a child actor. Uh, and then when Empire Films was really taking off, they purchased Dino De Laurentiis' old studio in Rome, and so that was kind of their, uh, their base of operations for a long time. And uh, one more, uh, but there is, you know, even after the uh, Empire Empire folded, uh, Charles Band was still going back to Italy very regularly. And this is as good a time to bring this up as any. It's because Charles Band owned a castle. He owned a castle in Italy called the Castello di Giove, which means the Castle of Jupiter. He details this in a, a, a great detail in his book uh, about how he was able to acquire this castle for probably far, far, far less than it was worth. But it became kind of a talking point for him. It became a way for him to court a lot of investors. And, like, uh, he would loan the castle out to buddies to go have, like, weekends. And he would shoot a lot of movies there. I think the movie that probably makes the most use of this set is Castle Freak, which we will talk about uh, sometime down the line. But Meridian is actually the first movie that we've discussed that makes use of this really sprawling, beautiful castle that he was uh, uh, living in part of the time, which is, it's a pretty wild story. Definitely check out uh, uh, Confessions of a Puppet Master if you want to hear the full story about mm -hmm. how he came to acquire this. Um, but it was a really good uh, a choice, and I think uh, there's a nearby tourist attraction near the castle called the Garden of the Beasts, or the Garden of the Monsters, and uh, they shoot a lot of content around that area and it's a really really cool uh set it's it reminded me a lot of in subspecies when they were able to film that like authentic uh, romanian festival that was going on in the graveyard it just it adds a layer of surreality and and accuracy and, and this to the movie this is like subspecies prototype it is this, this yeah, movie. yeah. It, it, and um absolutely Charles, I wanted to ask you because um, I, I interrupted before to to talk about us being people of a certain age. And Steve mentioned that he only saw this movie for the first time recently. Yeah. But you mentioned you had an interesting past with Full Moon and with this movie in particular. And then I think I got us off track for a second there. So wh where did you first discover it? Was it one of those uh, late HBO nights? Well, yes and no to a certain extent. So um, I, like both of you, um, are, are VHS raccoons, essentially, just kind of like skulking through the horror section, picking and choosing the most, the tawdry, the most tawdry looking VHS, VHS covers we can find and then going home and being thoroughly disappointed because it was nothing like what was advertised on the box. Um, that was definitely a part of my history, but, uh, I actually encountered Full Moon specifically as a studio, um, during, so my, um, my mom is from, uh, my mom was born in, uh, La Lima, Honduras, and I would go there during the summers, uh, to visit my grandparents. So during one of these summers... And I think I might have been about 10 or 11. It was the first time I'd gone by myself, uh, which was probably a terrible idea. I can't imagine sending my young daughter off to another country by herself at this age, but mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, <laughs> it was a different time, guys. Um, so I let's keep uh, that phrase in our mind for when we discuss some of the other elements of this movie. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, so uh, during one of these trips, um, I was staying in the guest bedroom. There was a TV set up, and um, I don't know if either of you are aware of what cable television is like in uh, what cable television is like in Central America. It's very different yeah. from what you get in the U.S. There's like a it's like a hodgepodge of like U.S. channels. Uh, channels from other Latin American countries and these bizarre what I can only describe is like the cable equivalent of alien transmissions and there was this <laughs> one 
<laughs> pirate this like pirate cable channel. I and I only assume it's a pirate ch- uh, cable channel because it had no name, no branding. It was just a blue screen that periodically you would see the word play across the screen and, and or, or across the screen and it was like uh someone just kind of like going through a catalog of vhs tapes and playing them on this cable channel um and it was always some very sketchy schlocky 90s horror movie that they yeah. would play um so in addition to like the full moon catalog i was just introduced to a lot of um gonzo vhs horror staples from that period um but you know they a lot of what they showed or what they a lot, a lot of what they broadcast were uh full moon features so i was able to kind of like mainline the big three franchises uh so you ha- you know i you, i watched the majority of I, I I think I watched the first three Trancers movies that way. A couple of subspecies, a couple of Puppet Masters. I think they showed um, Puppet Masters like maybe the the fourth one, an obscene number of times. I, <laughs> I you know I, I and it was years before I saw five, so I didn't get the resolution on that one um, mm. for a long time. But um. You know, it was just it was just at random intervals of the day you would pop onto this channel and they would be showing the most lurid, bizarre uh, horror movies, and a lot of them were from from Full Moon. Um, later in life, um, maybe not much later, I would kind of see these tapes at the the local video store and and, and kind of had a an aha moment, like ah, these are the weird movies that I was watching uh, that one time and that. Um, you know, sweltering little bedroom in Honduras. Um, and, and, you know, I think to a certain extent, the, the Full Moon catalog was the first time I ever encountered the notion of what a film studio is, which I think for a lot of us now is like a very basic concept. But whenever you're kind of just picking and choosing random horror movies and not really paying attention to those introductory logos, you can really kind of like lose sight of that. And uh, Full Moon was uh, both because of their really impeccable branding, but also because of those really excellent behind the, se- uh, behind the scenes featurettes that they would put at the yeah. end of the VHS tapes. Mm-hmm. You really got a sense of who Full Moon or what Full Moon was. I'm, I'm you know, not who, but what. Uh, what Full Moon was uh, and, and what kind of like authorial presence they had, right? It's I 100% like... agree, especially with the branding aspect of it, because I think you could approach, and now I've mentioned this in other episodes and Steve's mentioned it before too, that we have a real fondness for the way that Charles Band presented Full Moon as a brand. and But we didn't necessarily have the experience of really latching onto it as kids. But I would totally uh, had this had I been more cognizant of the fact that of like you're saying of recognizing Full Moon as a studio that I discovered really young, it w- I would have treated it like it was comic books, like it mm-hmm. was baseball mm-hmm. cards, like it was something, and it would have been one of those gotta catch them all type things where it would be like, oh, any mer- any film in any franchise that bears the Full Moon logo on it would be something I would then try to collect as, you know, put together as part of a collection. And I think that's a really a genius way about it. And uh, one of our favorite things uh, about that we mentioned in one of the r- recent previous episodes is about um, the video zone, like you just mentioned, and Charlie Spradling being sort of the spokesperson for Full Moon Features and hawking all their merchandise and trading cards and all that stuff, which I'm sad to admit I've actually been looking at some of that stuff on eBay because I'm yeah. like, oh, it's got to still exist. And I've been sending Steve links like, look at this, there's Puppet Master trading cards. And it's like, no, I have to stop myself because I will try to collect all of them. But let's take a second to to now pivot back to meridian and talk about charlie as she charlie, is credited, credited. As charlie yeah it's interesting we talked about charlie spradling uh once before when uh, she popped up in puppet master 2 
and she sort of became the default like face of the company. She was the girl in the video zone clips on the end of each video who was hawking merchandise. And I mean, I looking at her, I think she only appeared in like three full moon movies. I think it's this Puppet Master 2 and Bad Channels. But she still mm -hmm. kind of became like indelibly tied to the brand. Uh, she's appearing here alongside Sherilyn Fenn. And I think it's really interesting that they both kind of had the same 1990. They both appeared in three, uh, the three identical projects. They appeared in Meridian, Twin Peaks, and Wild at Heart. So that all they have the exact same credits, but obviously Sherilyn Fenn popped a little bit harder off of those, you know. So Sherilyn Fenn had been kicking around for a little bit, popping up in like low budget movies in the eighties. But I think most people's awareness of her was just because of her romantic entanglements. She was dating Johnny Depp for a long time in the eighties. She was dating Prince for a long time, you know. And then she started popping up in movies like Zalman King's Two Moon Junction, which is a very uh, a uh, sleazy erotic thriller, you know. So she was kind of building. I mean, brand Zalman King, way. say no more. Say no more. Yeah, you got it right there. Um, but 1990 was a big turning point for her, and Twin Peaks in particular was massive for her. She played Audrey Horn, who's kind of like this uh, precocious femme fatale type, uh, who's who's kind of uh, uh, weaving her way through this very dreamlike world. She got an Emmy and a Golden Globe nomination for her performance in this first season. Absolutely incredible performance from her in this. Um, really felt like she was going to be kind of the next big thing. And for some reason, her career never really hit the same heights as like a Sharon Stone or something like that. She had movies like Boxing Helena and stuff like that after this that were weird and interesting, but didn't really make her a household name. Um, but yeah, she's really good in this, I think. And uh, I think Charles Bam was pretty lucky to catch her sort of right at the cusp of her becoming like a, uh, the it girl for the moment. Well, um, that's not the only time that's happened too. I mean, if you go back in the early days of, of his uh, production company and empire stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, he got Demi Moore, Helen Hunt, right? Yeah. Right before Helen Hunt. I mean, he had a good eye, I think for casting people that he saw something with. And I yeah. mean, I don't, how could you look at, a 1990 Sherilyn Finn and not assume that she's going to become one of the most popular people in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. No, no, definitely. A really stunning, really beautiful woman. And like, this is an interesting movie for Charles Band to be making as well. Uh, they comment in, uh, it came from the video aisle, Dave J's book about the rise and fall of full moon. Uh, they, they comment that this is a movie that feels like a lot more effort was put into it than uh, a lot of kind of the sleazier horror films, which I can agree. Like, I think there's there's a, there's a real effort to set tone and mood in this movie, which is very interesting. And this is also, we talked a little bit in the Test Tube Teens episode that for as prescient as Charles Band can be, especially about the home video market, he was a little behind when it came to softcore erotic films. And it's mostly because he himself, Charles Band, is a shy man who is uh, nervous about asking actresses to take their clothes off on camera. Like, for as much as that appears in his movies, he is always very nervous to ask people to do that. And so I think he was reluctant to get into this erotic zone. Um, but this one, he said he based more, mostly off of, like, Harlequin romance novels. He said they were increasingly taking on these supernatural elements to them. And he thought this would be a good idea to kind of extend the Full Moon brand a little bit in that direction. And so what I think we get here is basically a gothic love story that has elements of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, weirdly, elements of David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers are in here as well. Uh, but it's also uh, it, it's a more serious minded and uh, sometimes a, a romantic movie than you get with a lot of other Full Moon features. Like, like the, yeah. the, the, the nudity, which is very present, of course, is not the whole show. It's not the whole point of the of the movie here. Yeah. And I know it. Is... And I do. I do love the the use of the. Um, was it the Park of Monsters? Yes. Yeah. The mm -hmm. use of the Park of Monsters is cool. And <clears throat> I like what I like about that is so you get. You get the introduction to Catherine, which is Sherilyn mm -hmm. Fenn's character, as having inherited a castle. You know that old story. Yeah, and happens. so she shows up. She shows up uh, in Italy. Uh, I should say, like back to this place where she's been. She's gone to the United States to go to school, um, and her friend 
comes to see her and she wants to have a big weekend, but her friend says, I'll only have one night because I have to get back to restoring this painting for the archbishop. And so they decide, you know, they, they, they hear something, they go look outside, they notice a gathering of people, they walk out of the castle and they essentially walk into a Jodorowsky movie. They really and do, you, yeah. <laughs> you have, you know, I was expecting to see a couple, like a, you know, double double arm severing and some some acid being thrown on some dicks, but we don't get any of that. Some... But we do, we do get a little, uh, you know, a little magic knife throwing. I realize that knife throwing is something in movies that I thoroughly enjoy. Like I I, I love a good knife throwing scene, but you get. This little, I mean, they're really bound by budget here with what they can do with this world of wonders. It's oh, like yeah. we've got one strong man with some chains. We've got a belly dancing woman. We have a dwarf. We have real quick. Uh, I want to I want to pause on the dwarf because this is hmm. uh, an actor who's going to be coming up a lot for us during the full moon. This is a guy named Phil Fondacaro. Uh, he first started working with Charles Band for the movie The Dungeon Master in 1984, which is increasingly becoming like the Rosetta Stone of the Full Moon universe. That's the <laughs> thing. Like every time we're like, like, oh, well, he first started working with Charles Band. It's usually on The Dungeon Master. Um, but he became a favorite of Charles Band's and he asked him to play the titular character in the movie Troll. And Phil Fondacaro was getting pretty fed up of playing like typical little person parts, you know, where he has to wear like a costume and a mask and just run around being a little boogin, you know, so he didn't want to do it. So Charles Band offered him the chance to play a uh, the uh, a professor, like in a monster hunter. Like, so he's playing two roles in the movie Troll, one of which is the troll itself, and the other is like an on-screen like performance where he gets to actually show his face, and that's not something that was being offered to little person, little people actors at that time. Uh, and so he would be a regular. He's going to continue to pop up over and over. Um, I believe he gets the lead roles in movies like Night of the Creeps and um, uh, Decadent Evil. Uh, and so he's, he still pops up from time to time. But I always like Phil Fondacaro. He was the he was the tough guy in Willow and uh, a bunch of other roles that I really like. He's got a he's just got a cool presence. Um, so I did want to just shout out Phil Fondacaro real quick. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he is an integral member of that small stable of performers. And then you get essentially um, one guy who looks like um, Mozart's father, Leopold and Amadeus. Sure. And then uh, the magician, which you, you later come to find their relation. You don't know it initially. Uh, they Here, mute and right Catherine and is taken by this magician and uh, her friend reluctant uh, tells her that she should invite them to this huge spacious castle for dinner. And I, I mean, they're just at this point, they're using this location really well. I feel like um, one of my favorite things about the Park of Monsters is in the description of how how this happened. We get an honest to goodness, a wizard did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always the go-to joke that, you know, ever since The Simpsons that I, yeah. that me and probably countless other podcasters make whenever something is unexplained. But here, uh, no, an honest to goodness, wizard did it. It did. Um, and then they they come for this dinner and again it's like this is this thing has energy it has extras it has costuming it has lighting and other other things going for it that are making it uh more like you said before steve classy then it takes a turn <laughs> all right so we'll i i we should uh, yeah, get this we, out we of do, the way we do need to discuss this all right so the the big kind of erotic centerpiece of this movie is a sex scene that's happening like two sex scenes that are happening simultaneously uh with uh, uh charlie spradling in one room and sherilyn fenn in the other room and it's a pair of that it's revealed that these magician this magician is actually a set of identical twin brothers so they are kind of pulling the dead ringers thing of like one will seduce them and then they'll swap out and you know so big old red flag there so, yeah, and the way that this whole sequence is facilitated is basically by roofing them. Uh, they, they get magical uh, uh, serums dropped into their glasses of wine that makes them very uh, compliant, and it, it's not a great look. There's a lot of red flags going on with this love scene here. Um, 
you know, there there is the titul the, the the titillation element because these are both extremely beautiful women who are completely naked. Uh, but you know, there is that also big red flag that's being sent up the entire time. I also, uh, independent of any of the troubling elements, I just found his very very puffy shirt to be distracting. I just kept thinking like. <laughs> Man, this this looks like a complicated shirt to remove. Uh, and then his pants are like hiked way up under his nipples. You know, it's like that style, you know. And uh, so I'm just like, all right. It's buck, buckling some swash. Yeah, yeah. He's doing a bit of that. Yeah. So, you know, it's it is simultaneously like if you remove the context of all of that. And if you're just looking at this scene like like in a vacuum, it's like, OK, this is some pretty sexy stuff. But when you have all the context behind it. And you realize the title, The Ravaging, you know, uh, is, is referring to this. Uh, it, it's, it's not great. It's not a great look. No, it's, there, is, there is a real disconnect between how this is presented to us uh, via the gauzily lit scene of uh, heaving bosoms and, mm. and, and puffy shirts being tossed aside uh, versus the, the very real sexual politics of this, which are indefensible very disgusting. I mean, if you're going to take this at face value, you can kind of say this is drawing from that gothic literature, uh, the conventions of gothic literature. And well, and it's it's Harlequin he, too, right? He even said yeah, it's of exactly course, Harlequin. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, even even the days of Horace Walpole and Matthew Lewis, you're going to have the threat of sexual yeah. assault lingering in the in the periphery or at the forefront. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way in which it's presented to us is this sort of um, this this sort of like titillating male fantasy uh, and the fact that you know not to get ahead of ourselves but one of the rapists is essentially our central protagonist our romantic lead uh there's so many troubling dimensions that you have to juggle here uh you know whenever i first saw this as a as, as a young preteen i didn't know what to make of this because it's you know very very leering and surreal and dreamlike and uh you know for lack of a better word haunting but at the same time watching it as uh you know i don't want to reveal my age as a very old man uh it's it's incredibly troubling and disturbing yeah Yeah, i had the same experience yeah the same experience i saw this for the first time much younger and i think there's a real there's a real issue with like um like trickery and like sexual manipulation um in the objectification of these characters that it's really commonplace like we were saying before like harlequin novels i'm not too familiar with harlequin novels but like Mm. there might be other elements of this it could be something that isn't exactly the same as pouring powder into a drink it could be mind control but even that is not it raises a lot of questions of consent. And so here and it's very blatantly obvious, like this mm-hmm. is, this is what they're doing. And so they're, I feel like, you know, watching, we, we, we made the comment earlier about something being a product of its time. And like in this regard, this is really a product of its time because one of the lessons I'm sad to say that I sort of picked up on from movies and TV when I was growing up was that it was totally okay to objectify women and that if they were not initially interested in you, just trick them. Right. You know, yeah. And, and, yeah. and going now, back to like Revenge of the Nerds and like mainstream entertainment like that, it, it, it was just like this pervasive thing that is being couched as persistence um, in yeah, a way that I don't it, think we do anymore. It makes it a tough sit when you watch it now because, again, removed from context, I think Pino Dinaggio's score is really terrific in this movie. Another, oh, another banger. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, well, again, this the Pino Dinaggio is such a, uh, a gift for giving you the score that is exactly what you need, even if you don't think it's what you want. Yeah, like, I sort of discovered him when I did my big De Palma deep dive maybe 15 years ago or so. I didn't really mm-hmm. know too much about him as a composer, but he is becoming quickly one of my favorite film composers. And I keep seeing that he did. And I love the fact that he works within genre 
So you'll see him, like he did the amazing score for Body Double, Blowout, Dressed to Kill, all those films. But then, you know, you see him pop up for Tourist Trap with a really kind of screwball score. And then this one, which has got some synthy pan flute in it, which I appreciate. But the, the reason I bring up the score is because the biggest problem with watching this as a person who has undergone a lot of personal growth over the last, you know, 30 years is that it makes it really hard to take the sex scenes seriously mm. because the score is so romantic, mm-hmm. but the circumstances are not. Well, and the, and the it con- takes you out of it. The context of it, too, is that one of the brothers uh, has been inflicted with a curse where he will turn into like a wolf-like beast when he falls in love, which he does kind of in the middle of the sex scene with Sherilyn Fenn, you know, like, so there, there's a whole like other element to sort of unpack with that, you know, and the fact that she falls in love with him back after this this like violation that happens here you know the movie isn't really interested in having them process it in fact charlie spradling's character essentially walks away from the movie after this we see her in shots Mm -hmm. like where she's revealing another layer of this painting she's working on and getting a little bit more of the story uh, behind this uh, mystical circus and everything like that but she is essentially out of the movie and so we don't really get a sense of what she feels about jarring It, it's, how little I, she seems to care like it's like you know something bad happened last night and they stare at each other for a minute and they keep staring and then charlie spradlin says okay well bye and just buys one ticket out of moody movie city limits and yes you know we, we check in occasionally with her restoring the painting like you said but this movie is not interested at all in unpacking that like it it no. moves on to the next part which is more of Sherilyn Fenn, you know, lurking around the castle and talking to the blind fortune teller from Don't Look Now. Yeah. And it's actually uh very strange that Sherilyn Fenn was in this in Twin Peaks because Twin Peaks is plays up the horror of uh this type of trauma and assault. Um, and in, in a way that I don't think Meridian really is interested in at all. There's yeah. a, a total disconnect between the active mm-hmm. titillation uh, that that, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a very evocative, evocative lush, lushly filmed scene. And the editing is just uh, really draws you into this like dreamlike atmosphere. Uh, but then just like the, its refusal to even address uh, the sort of lingering trauma that comes from that, uh, aside from one sort of like very perfunctory uh, exchange that follows immediately afterwards, um, it, it's 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 again like I keep using the word troubling, but that's you know, aside from just like some lip service from Hillary Mason at one point, that's that's all we get. Yeah, yeah and it no, looks it, it, beautiful and it moves. And I think we've got the whole band stable of people that he would collaborate with. I mean, this is edited by Ted Nicolau. It's shot by Mac Alberg. It's a writing collaboration with Dennis Paoli. So in terms of them putting effort in to make something that looks artful and lush was a good word that you described for it, I think te- on a technically i think it's one of the most accomplished um i I don't i don't want to just hearken on that scene but i think there's a lot of moments in this movie that are that seem a lot more technically accomplished than what we might associate especially the charles band directed films i mean our only real frame of reference to this point of ones we've covered on the show are evil bong and i mean this is trouble troubling elements aside this is citizen kane compared to evil pong <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i mean but there is a weird disconnect where this is one of the more professional and and lush and beautiful looking movies in the whole full moon canon that we've seen so far but it does have those kind of troubling politics behind it that the movie's not not really equipped or willing to operate on, you know, because this is this is also like playing off of the the ravishment fantasy, you know, that a lot of the mm-hmm. old romance novels were were selling. But there's a difference when it's coming from 
a male writer versus when it's coming from a female writer or when the women characters are given a little bit more agency. We never really get to explore the inner psyche of any of these women. It is mostly a movie about these evil magician brothers and the curse and everything that's going on. So it is more story driven than it is character based. And so I think a story like this could work, you know, and it could be, uh, uh, explore consent and, and, uh, desire in really interesting ways. And I don't think this movie is really in a position to do that. I did want to comment on the beast costume. Cause there's a great story about the beast costume. Mm-hmm. Um, if it looks a little familiar to you, that's because around the time they were shooting this movie, they were also working on our, the, the uh, a costumer friend of Charles Vance was also working on Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, and there is a scene in that movie where uh, Dracula appears in like a beast form and he is similarly ravishing uh, a woman in the garden. And we only see the, the beast costume kind of briefly, but this is that exact same costume. This is literally the same one. The uh, costume designer dyed it and altered a few elements and then loaned it to Charles Band in exchange for a weekend at his castle. So that's <laughs> yeah. the power that having a castle in Italy will get for you. You can get somebody to risk their job and risk violating non-disclosure agreements to let you use a costume that will not be seen in a theatrical movie for three more years. Now we're so. going to dox him, Steve. It's Greg Cannon. It's Greg, Greg Cannon. Cannon. We're talking. <laughs> we're, do- we're doxing him. On hey, air, you know, he, right he was here. called out a... in the book, uh, and I'm sure, <laughs> the, you know, uh, bygones are probably bygones. The the Dracula movie was a huge hit. I don't think anybody's mad about it. Um, but yeah, I just think that's a funny story that that's how they got around it. And you know, again, I, we live in a a world where the Shape of Water is one uh, best picture. So you know, like a a, 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 a trans dimensional or uh, trans species uh, love story is not necessarily mm-hmm. out of the zeitgeist anymore. But Main, the mainstreamification of yiffing, I think, is what we're saying. That's what we're getting. This really. is where it all started. This is where it starts. Yeah, I mean, I I did find the second half of the movie to be a little languid. Um, you know, uh, it's much more plot driven. So it's a lot of like walking down cold, dark corridors and sort of waiting for Sherilyn Fenn's character to catch up to plot elements that we already know, you know, mm-hmm. so like we already know that they're brothers. And so the reveal, like pretty close to the end of the movie, that they're brothers is like, yeah, we, we know that we've seen this like this is not news to us. Um, and then there are, yeah, just kind of like I, I don't really buy that these two are in love. Uh, you know, he. His whole Oliver, the the good brother, his whole deal is that he's been cursed. Uh, he turns into a beast when he falls in love, and the only one who can break this curse is the person he falls in love with, who needs to kill him. So that's sort of the tension there, um, and so she needs to decide whether she loves him enough to kill him. And it's a it's a very, yeah, very Jane Eyre, very very Wuthering Heights kind of dilemma to be put into, very melodramatic in a lot of ways. And I could have used a little bit more of that melodrama a little a little a little pitched a little higher pitched a little uh crazier well and i think, I think... one of the oh sorry go ahead i think one of the primary problems with that is that malcolm jameson is not up to task he's not necessarily uh, he's not on par. this is an unfair comparison but he's not on par with jeremy irons and dead ringers uh no. in terms of like portraying this dual role uh, nor does he really have like the the charisma to play this dark, dangerous, byronic hero. He's just kind of yeah. He's he's hairy pretty, chested he's, furniture. He's, he's good looking. He's British. He uh, he he delivers his lines with like a soap opera kind of aplomb. You know, yes. like mm-hmm. there's I I don't think that, I think he's rising to the occasion here, but it, he's also not transcending anything that's expected of him uh you know he's he's not bad he's not distracting but yeah i don't i don't think he's really um drawing us in and making us believe that this man is uh so irresistible that you're willing to give up everything for him well so that's see that's what i was wondering in terms of making the story a little bit more plausible like is there a way in which the story beats happen in the same fashion that they do but then Malcolm Jameson, you know, wins the consent of Sherilyn Fenn. <laughs> like, could it be she reluctantly invites them for dinner and over the course of an evening with dinner and drinks, she's intrigued by him. Maybe you have another scene where 
she sees him on an uh, at another day. Maybe this maybe the the ravaging doesn't happen the same night. Yeah. Like could that because then I think the idea that she would have time to develop stronger feelings towards Oliver who is Oliver is the werewolf brother yes. correct La- yes that's and- right La- Lawrence and Oliver which I have to yeah. imagine is a Lawrence Olivier nod there but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah the most yeah sort of uh s- s- distinguished British actor playing Lawrence and Oliver <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow I didn't put that together till just now <laughs> yeah. I think you nailed it but because because then that takes away from the problem where it's like there is this underlying theme that you can't help but and i i i recognize that we're, we're probably there's probably going to be uh, people listening to this who are going to inevitably say like we're taking a 2023 approach to something that needs to be just viewed as a product of its time which sure but i think it adds to the validity of the story because what happens is there is this underlying feeling of like oh if you are predatory and you are like the uh a perpetrator of a sex crime for lack of a better word on a woman they will yeah. inevitably have stockholm syndrome and will be drawn to you because that's how life works question mark sure <laughs> yeah well and then there's also this the implication of you know his his venal desires are manifesting and in, in, in this li- sort of like literal beast form uh which you know it comes close to addressing the implications of the ravaging and the sort of troubling aspects i suppose but doesn't really approach anything it, do- it doesn't really like move beyond the layer of subtext and and even then it's just kind of very perfunctory yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I'm I'm with you on that. Like, yeah. It, it, overall, like, I don't know. It, it, it's it's a movie that carves a very interesting space in this catalog. Like, it, it isn't really like anything else. Like, even when you're comparing it to the erotic films that they did through Torchlight Entertainment or things like that, it it's just kind of got its own different, unique vibe and. You know, I'm I'm wondering if this just wasn't a hit for uh, for Full Moon because they never really tried to follow this up in any way. Uh, like you said, subspecies is maybe the closest, but subspecies doesn't really go for the same tone or the same uh, kind of troubling themes that this one explores. No, I yeah. mean it, it's it's a it's a reiteration of the same sort of gothic storytelling and set dressing and shares a lot of commonalities but i think this one this movie in particular has a lot in common i don't know if either of you have seen la bette from 1975 oh yeah the yeah 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 mm-hmm. uh which you know has similarly draws from the the sort of beauty and the beast narrative but also is just the sort of carnal bizarre surrealist retelling of the the beauty and the beast story with uh, unsimulated, uh, an un- unsimulated sex scene between uh, the, the Donald Sutherland the and Julie and Christie. The, the lady, yes, <laughs> Liz, Liz, Elizabeth Hummel, I believe her name was. Yeah, so could be it's, wrong with it's that. yeah. That this reminds me more of that than anything, and you know, it's it's Charles Band going in full full art house mode for lack yeah. of a better term. And it's it's not a successful, it's not a wholly successful experiment. And I can see why uh, this was in some ways a sort of aesthetic dead end for the full moon. Uh, you know, the, the fact that they never returned to this sort of film. Uh, it's it's not surprising. Yeah. No, but uh, I, I'm... I, I think there's a lot to like here. There's a lot to seize upon, and there's a lot to appreciate, even if overall the the story and the tenor of the uh, uh, plot here kind of mm-hmm. makes it a difficult pill to swallow these days. Yeah, yeah there's there, a scene in this movie where Sherilyn Fenn walks into a church to to atone her sins, and she's 
walking down the aisle between the rows of pews and the camera is sort of set back behind the pews to her left and the the shot tracks her as she walks in through the light of the church and it's really quite gorgeously constructed and i feel like that's an issue i have with this movie is that i think there there is a lot of well composed artistic uh shots and stage scenes and i think there's a a level of gloss and production value on this that you don't find in a lot of full moon production and i think right this was a project that everybody involved took pretty seriously in trying to make the best version of this for the budget really taking advantage of the park mm-hmm. of monsters and taking advantage of the countryside and the castle because i think it it translates really well on onto screen it's just it's really unfortunate that this incident in the story that i think could really turn ha, turn a lot of people off to the entire film happened so early in the film and that it's just it's hard to look past it and it's hard to get through where this this scene of assault is presented as something romantic especially by the the lighting and the mood and the music and it's really not a particularly romantic moment and i think that the idea the notion of romance in this movie is heightened and uh, magnified at the wrong times Mm -hmm. and i think it suffers because of that this is a hard movie to recommend to people in 2023 and we just have to understand that we as a collective society view stories of violence and abuse and differently than people did back then and so like everything we've been mentioning in this has to unfortunately be mentioned with a caveat that you're going to have potentially some triggering things and uh, I know that's not language that some older listeners like to hear, but I think it's hard to approach this property any other way. And uh, to to apologize and clarify my comments in the last episode, I mentioned that this might be our horniest episode ever. I want to clarify I did not see the movie before that, so I uh, was not fully aware of the whole context in there. I was just basing it off the fact that there are these two very gorgeous women that are uh, unclothed a lot of the time, but... The context really kind of uh, uh, pulls a lot of the energy out of that. I, I think in many respects, uh, w- when I first saw this movie, I there is a sort of like, there's an obvious lurid, uh, there there's like a very lurid appeal for this movie, but I think yeah. the things that have kind of like lingered with me longer than anything else are those isolated moments of real craftsmanship and beauty that you kind of get in the in, in isolation. And I agree with you. Like the second half uh, very much just becomes this sort of this, 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 it becomes a real snooze fest after a certain point. Um, but there are isolated moments and the use of deep focus photography or the very gauzy lighting or just seeing Sherilyn Finn bathed in this sort of hellish red that appears uh, whenever one of the brothers uh, crawls out of this sort of bizarre hell dimension. Uh, you know, there, there's so many evocative moments, these, these isolated scenes that kind of like linger with you um, even beyond just, you know, even kind of like disconnected from the whole. I think those moments are incredibly memorable and, and, and really gorgeous to look at and behold. But uh, absolutely, like there's so many caveats here. It's hard to even the the, the recommended the, the recommendation is so qualified. I don't even feel comfortable making it at a certain point. I think that's a good uh, that's a good way to phrase it, and that's actually a good way to transition over to our rankings list because I've been curious. Uh, I've been trying to figure out how I was going to rank this. We've been uh, uh, rating our movies uh, as we watch them, kind of in a uh, uh, building out the list as we go. Uh, currently, my number one is From Beyond, and my very bottom of the list at number 16 is Evil Bong. I think, for me, Meridian is going to go uh, 
Underneath Lurking Fear and Above Demonic Toys, which puts it at number 12 overall. Because I think there's a lot of good intentions here, there's a lot of good craftsmanship here, but maybe they didn't fully flesh out all of these ideas in a way that uh, makes it palatable today. So I think that's where I'm coming down on that. It's a, it's a little bit of lower tier, but I respect the effort and I respect the craft that, yeah. that happened. Like there's more craft here than we've seen in a lot of these movies. Yes, I am putting it similarly below Lurking Fear. But for, for me, um, I, I moved my list around a few times. And so <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm seeing it right now between Lurking Fear and Piranha Women. Okay. Um, which I think puts it, I didn't have mine numbered, but somewhere if we're talking, how many movies are we are in the ranking uh, so far? This, this is our 17th movie that we've covered. 17. Okay. So this is, it's putting it at about thir- 13th okay. then for me. So pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty close. Right. Yeah, I got to polish. I got to polish this up uh, and, and number them correctly. That way, when we hit the, when we can do a nice, uh, a nice round uh, top or, or, or 20, I'll have it uh, set in stone. I've been crossing things out and putting arrows and this and that. And it hasn't been the best system for this. But I sure. 100% agree with what, what Charles said. And I think our basic consensus for this movie is there's a lot of craftsmanship here, more than you see in your average full moon production. There's a lot of artistry. There's a lot of care taken to doing things a certain way. There is a lot structurally, a lot to like in this movie but it needs to be either recommended or viewed now with if not one multiple caveats and if you Mm -hmm. are able to get past that if that's not something that is triggering to you um then you might find a lot to like in this movie and i but i don't begrudge anyone to turn it off 15 minutes into it and decide that they don't want to continue that is a totally acceptable prerogative to have about this movie but i think this is top of the bottom tier so far for me because it is a little bit boring in its soggy middle um but yeah we knew coming into this so i knew a little more than steve knew coming into this that this was going to be a little more difficult to talk about than some of our our other uh features but you know there there is some some stuff to like here and i'm hoping that you know when we move on to our episode for next week we have fewer content warnings and caveats to give what are what are we looking at next week steve oh well almost no content warnings next week unless you're worried about something uh biting you while you're using the toilet uh in which case we would really need to warn you about the ghoulies uh because we're talking about we're doing a double header. We're talking about Ghoulies 1 and Ghoulies 2. Ooh. So we're, we're knocking both of them out in one go. Uh, Ghoulies, a very important movie for the Full Moon uh, uh, universe. And so we'll, we'll get into all of that. But uh, yeah, uh, way less sexy, but hopefully less problematic as well. And I'm, I'm glad you guys <laughs> caught them before they went to college as well. It's a good chance. Yeah, it's, it's definitely that. That's mm-hmm. when things get really troublesome. Yeah. Oh, my God. A ghoulie with a doctorate. Ugh, yeah. That's that's exactly <laughs> what I fear. I mean, that's most of the Supreme Court right now. It's just a bunch of uh, a bunch of ghoulies <laughs> with, with doc with with jurisdiction <laughs> with J.D.'s. Uh, oh, all right. Well, uh, Charles, thank you so much for being on the show with us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do you have yeah. anything to oh. plug or promote or, or tell anybody about? I have nothing to promote or plug. Uh, hey. If anybody wants to come over and watch Splatter Farm and just watch a bunch of uh, Polonia Brothers movies with me, uh, give we'll me a post ring. your address. In the so notes. Yeah. I, I will say this on on mic because why not, uh, Charles? I just went last week actually to uh, a special screening event of Splatter Farm, and I met Mark Polonia. And it was amazing. It was yeah. everything I dreamed it would be and more. And um, a, a guy who puts on horror events here under the moniker of Horror Boobs cultivate, uh, put this event on and had Polonia there. And um, I'm so looking forward to digging into his filmography more now because it, it it's just really incredible and i i watched the shark exploitation documentary on 
shutter and he's interviewed in it and i was like i was like yes mark polonia and now i'm looking forward to diving into that filmography more because the fact that you just name dropped splatter farm to me is so funny because that was literally the one me and a couple friends watched at uh, nighthawk last week and had an absolute blast Oh my god, I'm I'm like uh, we can talk about this off mic later, but I am just such a a diehard Polonia fan, uh, and 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 just hearing you say that brought a smile to my face. <laughs> uh, I I've actually like tried to threaten a friend of mine into doing a Polonia based a, a Polonia a Mark Polonia John Polonia podcast. Uh, I mean, point, you would have to, and I think that, the friendship that's the way you have to get happened. someone involved. Yeah. In that. Yeah, no, I think I think he was like, he was ride or die, and then I think he chose to die. Uh, <laughs> he was like, I refuse. No, sorry. Well, very cool. Well, we, well, we don't really give us any you. ideas for a Patreon show. No, oh definitely do not do not seed that. Yes, <laughs> please call uh, me. But back speaking, if that happens. yeah, <laughs> we you, know, you will be first in line if if that uh, seed materializes at all. Uh, But speaking about this show, if you've enjoyed what you've heard so far, uh, pass the word along to some of your friends to tell them to listen to Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks. Uh, You can follow us on Instagram at Puppet Masters underscore Castle Freaks for our official show Instagram. You can follow me on my personal Instagram at underscore Cowboy underscore Jerry. Um, If you have liked what you've heard so far, you can hopefully jump on to Apple Podcasts quickly and drop us a little five-star review uh, rating, I should say. And if you're so inclined, leave a review as well, because it'll just, yeah. you know, help us to uh, grow to a larger audience. And uh, a few people have written in uh, emails and stuff that we look forward to reading those on the air with you guys, too. And if, you know, we make mistakes or you want to just correct us or shout obscenities, with us you can reach us at uh puppet masters castle freaks at gmails.com steve what else have you got going on because this is not your only endeavor no that's true uh, i also have a podcast called cinema arcade where uh, we are watching movies and then playing the games based on them uh to discuss all the differences and similarities and wild different turns that they take uh so definitely check that out wherever you get your podcast you can find me on instagram at minotaur matador uh, that's basically the only place I'm on social media anymore. So uh, yeah, check me out there. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody again. And we will see you next week for a double dose of the ghoulies. So stay tuned. We'll get you in the end. <laughs> <laughs>